light a little bit and focus on a little bit of the biomedical aspects of our biomedical science program. So uh, I'm actually here to talk about bursting HIV's bubble. I just found that topic. So uh, right now, uh, I'm just going to give you some numbers. You know, take it down, there'll be a quiz in the end. <laughs> so uh, this is currently the number of people who are estimated to die in increase or like getting infected with HIV and eventually ha having AIDS. And obviously this number has really, it has really dropped since like 2008 and that's when the first initiative of heart therapy was started for spread out populations. And as you can see, still, till now the main population that's infected is Sub-Saharan Africa because that's the place where the HIV actually initiated and it's still spreading and it's mutating the most in that area. So the main thing is we have to design a drug that targets the HIV that is currently at approximately there are 2,000, I think more than 200,000 different types of HIV or mutations of HIV. So in order to target this virus or this deadly disease, we have to target a hotspot in the virus that is common to all these mutations, something that we can hit directly. And another, another number is currently the number of adults that are newly infected with HIV have dropped substantially because of the UNAIDS like stepping in and giving the drugs and therapy to people who are already infected. The new people who are going to get infected with HIV are dropping. Although still in the Sub-Saharan Africa, it's in millions. And I can say why, because I was invited as an HIV counselor to Uganda. I'm from Uganda, so my parents live in Uganda. So they invited me over there and I saw what's happening. So they are given, UNAIDS does provide them with the drugs and therapy. But what is happening is the, the patients over there don't, uh, you know, don't consign, they don't come back to take the drug. Either they think it's witchcrafted or you know, they have all these other beliefs that like resist them from coming back and taking more drugs. So if you don't take the drugs in a constant manner, like in a timely manner, then you're never going to get rid of the disease. And moreover, because you already started the drug, your immune system is going to drop down and then you're going <coughs> to die faster. So that's a big problem that's happening in Africa. And right now there are a lot of councils and a lot of these initiatives that are starting over there to educate the people about why this is important to stop the disease, not just for them, but also for the future generations. So that's, that's why I can tell you why the number is so high. And right now, currently, there are approximately 38 million people living with HIV all around the world. So it is an epidemic and we have to find a way to target it and eradicate it forever because I don't think this is a good way to be. So this is the strategy by UNAIDS as put forth in 2012 to getting down to zero. And I feel that's also my motto. Like I feel like that's what we all should be doing. Getting that number from 38 million down to zero. And these are the different strategies they put forward to like bring it down. So there's, there's first of all testing, the HIV testing in all the hospitals are now for free and you, you have to have like testing in like villages that do not have hospitals, they have like a crew go there from the local hospital and test, test people like I think in a four month fashion so that you make sure there's no people living with HIV and they're not aware of it. Because like I said, this virus doesn't do it much, it just drops or kills your immune system. So the regular uh, side effects or, or the effects that you'll be feeling is feverish or you're feeling cold or those kind of symptoms. So you will not feel like you have the virus until you get tested for it. So that's why they have increased HIV testing. And HIV testing is a must for people who are suffering from tuberculosis currently because the TB and HIV have a very, very close interconnection. And people with TB will eventually get AIDS or people with AIDS will eventually get TB. Then next is HIV care, so you have to counsel, like I said, make people aware of why you need the care, why you need ART, which stands for antiretroviral therapy. And the next is to make sure that the, virus, the drug reaches everywhere. So the, right now, in all these uh, other countries, they are having local um, industries or local drug industries starting to make these ARVs, so that with the transportation, is, you're saving on transportation and the availability of the drug is much faster. So you don't have to like wait for the next batch 
of your antiretrovirals to get here because again that's stopping the patient's treatment and that's going to just make the disease worse. The next is undetectability. So there's this major, major research money being put by NIH into the undetectable HIV. So there are a lot of people who are carriers of the virus but are, do not have any effects from the virus. So these are called the native populations. And I went for a conference recently of HIV and they're just you know, promoting the young investigators and anybody who can put in their minds and their thoughts, like people like you guys, you know, all the people who are studying, to understand this undetectable population, try to retrieve it out and try to treat that. Because that's the hidden population which might like, persist over the ages and like Latifa said, you know, who are the survivors and who carry the disease forward. And we don't want that to happen. So that's the media area which currently the research is popular. So this is a site which I really like because a lot of people are asked, which would you rather take, a bunch of medicines, one medicine, or no medicine at all? So eventually, we're not trying to give patients more and more medicines. We're trying to tone down the number of medicines they're take, taking and eventually find a cure. And this is where the whole vaccine development takes place. So you know they're trying to find a vaccine for HIV so that you reach that stage where you don't have to take any more drugs, your future populations are protected from this virus. So I do have some work which I'm trying to direct towards all these points. One is early detection and eradication, and the next is trying to find a vaccine because eventually that's what we want. We want some so that our future populations are no longer affected by the disease and you're protected with a lot of antibodies in your body. All right, so now to just change focus. This is the main culprit we're talking about. This is the HIV virus. A little bit of science. Uh, the virus, it looks, is a retrovirus. It has a viral membrane. <laughs> it has a viral membrane, which actually, if the virus, it gets into our host cell membrane, the viral membrane consists of a part of our host cell membrane. So it's like a what you call it, parasite. It kind of sits in your host cell. The host cell becomes a virus-producing machine, and then the host cell starts budding off new viruses. And that's why this membrane is very similar to our cell membrane. And there's a lot of work on our cell membrane. So if we can study more about our cell membrane, it also helps us study more about the viral membrane. The next is the virus spike proteins, and this is called the virus spike because it looks like spikes. It's really like that. That's why they call it. And it consists of two glycoproteins, which is GP120 and GP41. I'm just saying that so that in my future slides I'll be talking about targeting these two proteins. Because this is the first protein that interacts with the cell. So we want to hit the virus as soon as it targets or hits the host cell so that we make sure the few next processes in the HIV life cycle no longer take place. So we're hitting the virus as soon as it targets the host cell. The next is the viral RNA, which converts into DNA and then you know gets integrated with our host cell membrane, I mean a host cell nucleus, and then the host cell starts producing the viral proteins. And then there are other proteins that help with this carrying of the RNA into the host gene. So I'm not going to focus too much on the main proteins. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure you guys know is this is a retrovirus, so the RNA is actually encapsulated in a capsid which consists of a protein called P24. So the virus has the virus, the viral membrane, which is like a bilayer membrane, just like our whole cell membrane. And then it contains a capsid in which the viral genome can, is consistent. So it's kind of protecting the viral genome. Okay. So like I said, this is the HIV life cycle. It usually uh, only binds to viral cells that are immune cells, like T cells or B cells or macrophages. So it only hits our immune system, it doesn't bind to blood cells and others because the spike protein on the virus specifically binds to a host cell receptor called CD4 which is present on our immune cells and then CCR5 which is a core receptor. And then once it's, co once it's uh, bind, bound to the host cell membrane, it goes through and the two membranes merge together and that capsid which I talked about is pushed into the virus. The capsid is uncoated and the viral genome is released into our cell. Then using the reverse transcriptase, it converts into DNA and then integrates into our host genome and starts producing new viruses. So this is the whole virus life cycle. It's the most simplistic image I could get so that everybody understands. So, like I said, AR 
to your antiretroviral therapy that's currently being provided targets several stages of this HIV lifecycle. The NFTI and NMRTI is uh, the first drugs ever to be made to target the virus. And this targets the, the later on step in the HIV lifecycle called reverse transcription. So that's that's where this NNRTI and NRTI is hit. And then integration is another step which the ARBs hit, which is the integration of the viral genome into the host cell genome. And then the last stage is you know the budding. So the once the virus is bud, in order for it to mature, there's something known as protease digestion. So there are protease inhibitors that stop this digestion, so it makes it an immature virus which cannot infect new cells. So these drugs have been developed. The least amount of drugs that have been developed is the first stage, the entry and infusion. There are only two drugs currently in the market that target that stage, and they're not even used in the regular therapy, they're used for salvage therapy. So I always ask the question, why didn't you ever find drugs for the first step? That's because this first spike protein has been mutated so many times, it's so difficult to target that, that protein because, you know, it keeps mutating so that it kind of tricks the host environment because that's the only protein that's exposed to the host. The rest are all encapsulated in the virus. So that's the reason why there's such limited development in that entry stage and which you need to put more input and develop more drugs against that stage. So just a brief thing about HIV's life cycle. I think I'll just make sure this Okay. So this is how the virus enters the host cell. That's the virus and this is the cell membrane. First thing it does is GP120 contacts with the CD4 cell receptor. Once it modifies, it binds to the co-receptor. And once the co-receptor is bound, GP41, GP120 moves away and exposes GP41. And that kind of plunges into the cell membrane. And once that happens, there's something known as a six phase bundle formation that zippers both the membranes together, eventually forming a pore and pushing out the capsid, which contains the viral genome. So that's the first steps of entry, which our, our lab has been focusing on. So there are two stages which you can target in the entry process. One is when the CD4 binds to the GP120. That's the first, first step. And the next is when it binds to the co-receptor. So it's like the mouse trap kind of thing. My professor likes to show this image because we're trying to trap it right there. So the other thing is, <laughs> you know, it's pretty physical. <laughs> so the other thing is CD4, the place where CD4 binds on GP120 is not mutated. It's 98% conserved among all these different mutations of HIV because CD4 receptor never changes its shape. So the GP120 on the virus needs to keep that lock key mechanism, otherwise it can never fuse with the receptor. So our, our, our lab focuses on targeting that CD4 binding pocket on the virus because that is 98% conserved and so therefore we can target all these different populations of the virus. So my hypothesis is to target the metastable HIV envelope and therefore target it so that we can make an irreversible inactivation of the virus. The thing is we're focusing on the virus, so this can be used as a microbicide, as a, as a preventative. So that even before the virus enters into a host environment, like right during when the HIV is transmitted, you can target the virus and stop it from spreading. And therefore this will be used as a virucidal or virus lysing agent. That's why the top A bursting HIV is bubble, because I really want to break it down before it enters the host. <laughs> So a little bit of chemistry, whoever is chemistry here will understand all this. These are amino acids and building blocks of a protein. Our lab focuses on making peptides, which are small versions of a protein. And we are making peptides because our body is used to peptides, so it won't treat it as a foreign entity. It will just make sure it's biocompatible. Uh, so these are the modifications that we've done in the lab. There's a cysteine or an SH added at the end, which will give rise to some uh, cool effects which I observed during my first year of PhD. What I saw is that the cysteine containing peptide not only stops the virus from entering the cell, but it has this additional effect of leaking out the capsid. The P24 which I was talking about, which contains the viral genome, it's actually leaked out from the virus when I treat it with this peptide. So there's been already, you know, my lab has already developed this inhibitor to stop 
the barrel entry by targeting the CD4 binding protein. But by adding the cysteine, I saw this additional effect of poration of virus lysis. So that's really cool because you know it's it's pretty much bursting the virus even before it targets a virus cell. So we had to do more research on that. We did a lot of findings. We looked at which all stages it targets. So we we saw that this peptide stops the CD4 from binding and also from the core receptor from binding. So there are two steps. It's called dual acting. So therefore, this peptide is not only dual acting but it cascades down. So what I found out was that it fakes the virus to think it's fusing with the cell. So what I found out was that first stage it does, it stops the virus from entering into the cell. And this is results showing that the viral infection drops down with increasing treatment of the peptide. So that was the one thing I saw. And here the is the one with the thiol, which is the virucidal one, and this is the control peptide, which also stops the virus from entering. The next thing I saw is that the GP120 or that surface protein on the virus gets shed off when you put the peptide on it. So it's kind of shedding off the GP120 and if you shed off GP120 from the virus, it no longer can bind to a cell. And that, that makes sense, that's why it, does, it stops it from entering into a cell. So I found that out. And in addition, I saw only the thiol containing peptide forming that leakage activity. There have been a lot of research done in my thesis. Everybody's invited to see my defense, which is next week on May 22nd. Uh, so what I found out was that this particular peptide is faking the virus to think it's fusing with the cell. And therefore, it's making the virus go through those stages which I showed at the beginning of porating and opening up and pushing out the capsid. But the capsid doesn't go into a cell, it just goes out into the environment. So it's literally hijacking the fusion mechanism and therefore making it fuse into the environment and bursting it. So there are future work. Oh, I did TM analysis to look at how this virus looks like. So this is how the virus looks you know, much before the treatment. And once 60 minutes post this peptide treatment, you see the virus shrinks down and this core capsid is no longer <coughs> visible because it gets pushed up. So that's what I believe is happening. So I'm an engineer eventually. I have to put some design concepts into this. So I designed a gold nanoparticle conjugate with the peptide around it to make it more potent. So what I'm doing currently is by putting, these are different sized gold nanoparticles and I put the peptide, that lysine peptide around the gold. So what it's doing is, is the, it's increasing the local concentration of the peptide on the surface of the virus. So if you will, you can imagine the virus to be a giant nanoparticle with different multivalent binding sites. So if I make a giant peptide with multiple spots of the peptide around it, it can hit multiple GP120s and therefore it can do this virucidal action even faster. And that's what I saw. This is the peptide alone and this is the gold conjugate with the largest size gold which I made. What I see is that the potency of infection inhibition as well as the release of this capsid is much, much better. You need much less concentration of the peptide to get the same effect. So you're actually making this a more drug-like candidate, using less of the drug and getting the same effect. So that's what was our goal. So these are the future plans of our peptide inactivations. You know, we're studying more of how to make this an immunogen. I didn't hit on that. Like I said, we're also going the vaccine route. When we take this residual virion post lysis, you know, I saw, saw that tiny virus that was shrunk. That virus actually exposes a lot of viral proteins outside and that is completely inactive. So if you use that like leaked out virus as an immunogen for your body, you can actually generate antibodies against the virus. So that's another route our lab is actually focused on. And then I also found out that this virus is able to kill newly producing viruses from our body. Because you know we're not only looking for prevention, we're looking for treatment of people who are infected. So if you use this peptide, we're actually targeting the viruses that are being produced from the host cell, even before it gets butted out, because you saw that shedding happening. So GP120 can shed from cell surfaces that are already infected. So that even before the budding happens, you're pretty much killing the virus. So that's that. So eventually, I found out the peptide inactivate the virus by binding to the CD4 binding pocket. 
therefore making sure that it's conserved region and we can target multiple populations of the virus. The next effect I saw was that the thiol containing peptides and the gold conjugates were able to lyse the virus and completely inactivate it and it's irreversible so it can come back and be functional. And the next thing I, I didn't talk about but we are focusing on it is to use the peptide, the gold conjugated peptides not only stop new virus production but it also kills the cells that are infected. And why this is important is like I said, I was talking about the latent populations, the, the, virus, the cells that carry the virus but are, do not produce, uh, produce new viruses. So if this gold nanoparticle conjugate is able to kill the cells that are infected but don't produce new viruses, you're actually targeting that latent population. So therefore you're completely eradicating the disease. And the last step is to use this as an immunogen. So you're making a custom-made immunogen for the patient because you're taking their viruses, treating it, and putting it back in the patient to produce antibodies against the virus for stopping future infections. These are my publications. You know, I had to show off a little bit. Mm -hmm. So these are the two publications. You guys can read about it. One is in 2011 and one is 2013. And I don't know if any of you have read about this Devi molecule, which uh, Drexel did a press release on it. And this is the, another area we focused on to target the virus. The eventual goal is to lyse the, burst the virus, but this is using a different type of uh, conjugate. So it's uh, something that anchors to the viral membrane, and the other part binds to GP120. So there are two places you target on the virus, pretty much like pop, op opening up a bottle. So you grip on the viral membrane and pop open the virus so that it leaks out. So I'll just show you the video because Somebody in Drexel made it, but this is what our lab is also focused on for people who are looking or interested. You know, you can understand what all our lab works with. So this is a daylight molecule, like I said. It latches onto the viral memory, binds to GP120, and pretty much pops it out and then leaks out the current flow from it. So these, this is another different topic. Our eventual goal is to eradicate the virus, but we try different agents to do this. So thank you all. And like I said, our eventual see this is my professor says Peter Gardens I just photo but I think it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so using different targets and our eventual goal is to get T to zero because that's what we want. Thank you.
question for Rosemary. Yeah. You know, you haven't mentioned economics at all. You know, recently they were talking about a cure for hepatitis C. Uh -huh. But each tablet that you take is going to cost a thousand. Exactly. Dollars. That's so, why uh, uh, the, the peptides are a bit expensive. You're right. The, what our lab focuses on, that's a limitation.